from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Rob Casper, the head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress, and it is my great pleasure to introduce John Milliken Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thompson is uh, a wonderful addition to the Poetry and Prose Pavilion as a writer who has uh, recently uh, found his way to fiction. He is the author uh, previously of 10 uh, books by uh, National Geographic, including America's Historic Trails and Wildlands of the Upper South. He is also co-author of the National Geographic Almanac of American History. His articles have appeared in Smithsonian, Washington Post, Islands, and other publications, and his short stories have been published in Louisiana Literature, South Dakota Review, and many other journals. And he has lived in the South all his life. And it is with that knowledge and with that background that he is uh, here today to read from his first novel called The Reservoir, published by the other press. This novel is based on a true story from the 19th century. It's about um, an early spring morning in Richmond, Virginia in the year 1885 when a young woman was found floating in a city reservoir. It appears that she has committed suicide, but there are various clues to the scene that suggest foul play. The novel describes uh, not only that discovery, but the trial that ensues, and it was based on historical events, and I'm sure he will, oops, he will play it out uh, in his reading today, and um, I can't wait to hear. Please uh, welcome John Milliken Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thanks all of you all for coming out today to the uh, mall for the National Book Festival. I'm just going to grab a little water here, a little reservoir water. Um, it's a real privilege and pleasure to be here at this event. I want to thank the Library of Congress for holding this wonderful two-day event and for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's a real honor. So my debut novel just came out in June, and um, I spent a good deal of the summer traveling around uh, talking about it. Um, I, went to, I was on a 15-city book tour, um, and I've done a couple of festivals. There's writers that have said that bringing out a book is something like having a baby. I've never had a baby. But I can say uh, on a little safer ground that it's a lot like uh, sending a kid off to college. You know, you spend all these years nurturing your son, in my case, and um, you do what you can for him. You tell him stories, you make him laugh, you impart what moral precepts you might have. And at a certain point, then, it's time to let go. And you send him out into the world, um, and you hope that he does well and that he prospers and that he doesn't come home anytime soon. Um, <laughs> But, you know, at a certain point, you've done all that you can for him. Anyway, you, you still want to brag a little bit about him. So I guess that's what I'm doing at this point. I'm, I'm taking my book out and talking about it. And it's really wonderful to get to connect with audiences this way. So what I'd like to do today is just tell you a little bit, just summarize my novel briefly, and then tell you a little bit about how I came to be a writer and how I came to write this book in particular. Uh, and then I'll do a short reading and we should have time after that for questions and answers. So, um, the book. It is uh, it's the story of a young woman who was found floating in the reservoir in 1885 in Richmond. Um, and this book then, the, the, this case became a sensational trial and, uh, and it was carried in newspapers all around the country. Now, my publisher likes to call it, and publishers love to come up with these fancy catchphrases. He has called it, in cold blood meets cold mountain. I, it's, not, it's not quite right, but it just shows you that it crosses a couple of genres. I have a, a little more um, prosaic thing that I call it. I call it a romance wrapped inside of a mystery, wrapped inside of a historical crime novel. And the reason that I start with that term romance is that at the core of this book, there is a romantic triangle between the victim, Lily, 
her cousin, who was a rising young lawyer from a nearby county, and then her cousin's brother, Willie. You get to know these characters very well during the course of this book, and it builds to a sensational trial, as I said, and there are some dark family secrets that are revealed along the way. So uh, that's, in a nutshell, what this book is about. Now, how did I come to write it? Uh, well, I want to go way back and start with my origins as a Southern writer. So I was born in Chatham County, North Carolina, where both sides of my family had come from for more than 200 years. My father was an old-time lawyer and judge with a big, booming, storytelling voice. Um, and he, to this day, loves telling jokes and stories. My mother also told stories in a more sort of quieter, more personal way. So I had the Southern storytelling tradition in my background, but I didn't really think of myself as Southern. It's just what we were, you know. We, you didn't have anything to compare it to. That is, until we moved to the big city, which happened to be Washington, D.C. Um, and here I came in contact with people from all different kinds of places, different kinds of people. Um, and that's where I first learned that I was Southern. I had a friend that, that uh, said my accent was so thick when I moved here that he thought I was British. <laughs> and another friend later from California was amazed that there were people, uh, there was anybody who had grandmothers named Miss Myrtle and Mama Joyce. But it's true. Now my first English teacher here was a formidable Dickensian style old schoolmaster named Mr. Pratt. And one day I was reciting one of Pratt's 40 rules of grammar. And, and, uh, and he stood there, he has his hair slicked back and this kind of yellow green sheen. And he just growled at me. And he said, Thompson, you talk like you have a hot potato in your mouth. So the result was, I just stopped talking altogether for years. I think that's the reason, one of the reasons I became a writer later on. I, I, there was things I wanted to say, and never dreamed that I'd be down here talking about Mr. Pratt. But I will say that he is one of the first people that, um, that encouraged my writing. He said it had flair. I think that was on one essay. But um, anyway, so at that point I realized that I was different, um, and that there were certain things you could do to shed that accent. But what you couldn't shed was your heritage. You, you just had this family history and you could either ignore it or as I came to do later as a writer to embrace it. And I think writers, um, particularly creative writers and fiction writers especially, need to have a reckoning with who they are and where they're from. So skipping ahead then, I uh, decided to go to college in Virginia. Um, and there I did a, a practical thing and an impractical thing. I uh, was pre-med. And I also majored in English. So now I was reading the great books for classes, but I was also on my own. I was starting to read, and I'm not sure why I started, but I just started to read the great Southern writers. I read Thomas Wolfe, his great North Carolina writer, uh, Robert Penn Warren, and William Steyer, and these are just a few of the writers I was reading. And an amazing thing, it was just a revelation to me. It was just a mind-altering, experience to come across these authors for the first time in my teens. It was more mind-altering than any of the alternatives at the time, and that's because these wonderful rolling cadences that these writers were writing, a lot of it came right out of the King James Version of the Bible, um, and this, this fresh language and these stories and images spoke to me really on a personal level. Um, and I think that's what all the great writing does. It speaks right to us personally. And you say, aha, this is real, and this is true, and it has meaning. So I got very excited anyway, and I think a seed was planted. I didn't decide I'm going to become a writer at that point. I, I came to that a lot later in life than a lot of people do. I was in my mid-20s when I made that commitment to being a writer. Well, anyway, around this time, I had various jobs. Uh, during and after college, I was at various times a steam fitter's apprentice, a farmhand, a carpenter. I was a paralegal, briefly a bartender, and even more briefly a medical school student. So I did, uh, I did give that a try. 
But I ended up taking a job uh, with a television production company here in Washington called Smithsonian World. Um, and there, for the first time, I came in contact with people who were making their living in the arts. And this was a very exciting time for me. The young people that were film editors, producers, writers. The host of this show was a man who was pretty well known at the time. He's a lot more famous now. His name is David McCullough. One day I was taking David home uh, from work, and he lived in Georgetown. And I made the fatal error somehow of getting off on the Whitehurst Freeway. I don't know if any of you all have done that. Which means that you can't get to Georgetown. You have to cross the river, go into Virginia, drive way up on the George Washington Parkway, and do a U-turn, like miles out of the way. Well, I knew all this. Um, I wasn't sure David knew this, though. He was new in town. So I was just going to pretend like everything was fine. Um, and, but he's a pretty smart guy. So by the time we got to the river, he had it figured out. And he was gracious enough to say something about how, you know, it's hard to drive in the city, and I've done this before. But the great thing was that for a while, I had this captive writer in my car. And he started telling me about how he himself became a writer. It was very interesting. He said uh, he was working on a magazine uh, on staff. I think it was American Heritage. And he said he met the Western novelist Louis L'Amour. And Louis L'Amour was very prolific. And so he asked him, you know, how is it that you churn out all these novels? What's your secret? And Louis L'Amour said, four pages a day. So David McCullough said to me, so I figured if Louis L'Amour could write four pages a day, I could write two pages a day. And that's what he did. And I just loved that answer because it was just so pragmatic and workmanlike. You sit down at your typewriter, in his case, I think he still uses the same typewriter, um, and you just put the words on the page. There, there is some magic to it as well. I don't want to take away from that. But there's a lot of just sitting down and working. Um, so that was, that was great. Well, anyway, after this experience with Smithsonian World, um, I took a job with a magazine, it was a new magazine at the time, National Geographic Traveler. So I got a chance to actually see my own words in print uh, for the first time. I was a researcher and um, fact checker. So um, wh what I started doing there was writing captions. And the captions in those days were like little poems and stories in themselves. I mean, they were really meaty uh, uh, and substantial pieces of writing, little sort of word puzzles. And then I got a chance to explore a little bit beyond that and do some travel uh, writing, travel articles. At any rate, I decided I would try my hand at freelance writing. And I've done that now for years. Um, I, what I've done is travel around doing travel articles, uh, guidebooks, um, books on history, natural history, um, and reference type books. A lot of these books are probably sitting in your doctor's offices right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, they are in my dentist's office, I know, and when I go in there, I, I, I usually find one and sign it. Um, but, but they're the kind of books that are also maybe on your coffee table. So you, you look at them, and they're beautifully illustrated books, and you, you look at them while you're waiting for your wine and cheese or your, for your appointment. Occasionally, your eye will stray down to the printed text. You know. So what we're trying to do as writers is tell stories that really pop off the page you know, they grab readers' attention fast, and it's a very hard, it's, well, you're competing with the photographs, so it's really impossible to do that because these are National Geographic photographs. But so as a, as a, um, as a writer, that's what you're trying to do, tell these compelling stories in a quick way. Now, as a traveler, though, I uh, got to travel to 48 out of the 50 states, and what I realized was that geography and place were very important to me. So my wife and I were living in Arkansas. We decided to move closer back to home, which meant moving to, we just, just picked Charlottesville, Virginia, because there was a burgeoning writer's community there. And I, at this time, I was doing other kinds of writing as well. We were in Arkansas. I was getting a master's degree in, fi in, uh, 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 in creative writing. So I wrote a lot of short stories, published a few of those wrote a lot of novels, published none of those. Um, I pretty much decided that nonfiction was my thing. A few years ago then, I was in Richmond 
doing some research and I was really interested in the Civil War period because I knew that it was a very exciting, uh, dramatic time in Richmond's history. Especially at the end of the war, there were, the, the harbor was burning, uh, uh, the, the warehouses down there and the warships exploding down there in the harbor. A lot of these stories had already been told, but I came across a story that dated 20 years after the war, which to me was every bit as interesting a period, and partly because it's just not as well known. It's sort of a black hole of American history, post-Reconstruction, but pre-modern. And the story was that there was this body of a young woman floating in the reservoir. Um, now a coroner came and he thought, okay, probably a case of suicide. Uh, this is an unknown young woman. Looks like she's thrown her life away. But there were some strange uh, artifacts found around the reservoir grounds, and I'll just mention a couple. There were, there were um, a, a, a veil, uh, a woman's glove. There was also an, an old-timey watch key for winding up a pocket watch. And these became clues. In addition to this, there were some strange marks on her forehead and uh, on her face that just didn't quite square up with suicide. The result was that a search went out for a possible killer. Um, her cousin was brought in for questioning. He was brought to trial. This trial then became a sensational event that was carried in newspapers around the country. Now, I got interested in this story for a couple of reasons. One was the nature of the event itself, the death of a young woman. I was also researching Poe at this time. It turns out that Edgar Allan Poe um, spent more time in, uh, in Richmond than anywhere else. And I, so I was looking at one of his essays and he wrote something to the effect that the death of a beautiful young woman is the most fit subject for poetry. And it's, it's true, it's a very poignant and, and just innately tragic subject. The other thing that I was really interested in about this story was the place itself. Richmond, I didn't really know, I, li I had lived in the South, I'd lived in Virginia, but but um, at this point, longer than anywhere else myself, and yet I didn't really know our state capital. Um, I, I knew that it was uh, a place with these stories and some warm, eccentric people and warehouses. <laughs> didn't know a whole lot else about it. So I was very curious, and <clears throat> I had a sense that it was a place that, like a good many Southern families, holds these secrets, and not only holds them, but holds on to them. And there so that there would be possibly a paper trail that I could follow back into the past and find out some of these skeletons in this closet, even in a cold case. So sure enough, I started digging around in the libraries, looking at the old newspapers um, and through the, the old case files. And there were just reams of material. It was really amazing. All, all the the uh, old court records, stenographer's notes, and even um, case evidence had been preserved. This was a very big, it was sort of like the OJ case of its time. So I started working with this, um, just trying to get a sense of what this story was, what it meant, and get some sort of narrative flow to it. But I realized after a while, a couple of things. It, it was just like sand sifting through my fingers. And the one thing, um, that I realized I wasn't going to get through digging through this evidence was just who these people were. They were fairly obscure people at the time. Um, so other than the about a year and a half that the newspapers covered this story, there wasn't a whole lot of information about these people. The other thing, and the most burning question to me that I realized I was not going to get, no matter how much I dug through those files, was I was not going to discover what really happened one snowy night long ago at the reservoir. And so what had started out as a nonfiction project then turned 180 degrees around and became a fiction project. And the result is my novel, The Reservoir. And I call it a fictional telling about real people and what might have happened to them. And the, the final thing I want to say about it is that even though it's deeply attached to its time and its place, Richmond 1885, it's not just, I don't think of it as just a Richmond story or even just a Southern story. It's really a story about human weakness and failing 
and about those age-old themes of lust and betrayal and revenge and the search for justice. So that is sort of the story and then the story behind the story. So now what I want to do is read to you uh, from the book, and it'll be a short reading. Um, so uh, it'll be about eight minutes or less. And um, what, what this, I'm going to read to you from the first scene of the book. And this is where the body is discovered. You'll meet a couple of reservoir workers. You will meet a coroner and uh, a private investigator. And you'll get to know all these people later in the story as well. And this is much as the um, story unfolded to Richmond readers at the time uh, when they opened their newspapers. Um, so here it goes. And by the way, there's a few lines of prologue in the beginning. In a sort of different poetic voice. You'll realize when I've changed. I'm going to turn the page for one thing. The way it floats in the water so serenely in the moonlight and the sunlight, you would have thought it was meant to be there, pure and unyielding and as solid as silk. She floats there, a mystery as deep as the moon and the mind of God. What does it mean? A pregnant girl floating in the city's drinking water. On March 14, 1885, a body is floating in the old Marshall Reservoir in a light snow and then under a waxing moon. In the morning, the superintendent of the reservoir, Lysander Mead, discovers a furrowed place on the walkway that he does not remember seeing the night before. Someone has crawled through the fence again. Early in the year for youngsters to be out cavorting at night. He glances down toward the water and sees what appears to be a dress. It's floating along the edge of the water where the embankment slopes down to a picket fence. He's seen a lot of oddities in his years, rubber condoms and smutty books and the occasional sack of puppies but never a dress. He tries to imagine the scene. Mighty cold last night for such carryings on, except now he sees it isn't just a dress, but a whole person, a woman, and a dead one at that, or what appears to be. Never has he found a dead woman, nor man neither for that matter. So down he goes for a better look. Who would not want to see a dead woman? Could she be something to look at? Could she be a fine looking lady? Or might she be one of your more common sorts? Mr. Lucas comes up from the pump house where he has been repairing a stopcock and helps Mr. Mead with his speculations. They stand there together, Lucas a head taller, loose-limbed and slack-jawed with stick-out ears, while Mead, wearing thick eyeglasses, bends rigidly forward at the waist, his navy jacket stretching across his back, his neat mustache crinkling as he sniffs the air. All they can make out at first is a gray wool dress with flounces at the bottom and hair hanging like dark weeds about her head. The grappling hook's the thing, Mr. Mead says. Mr. Lucas comes back presently, hook at the ready. But now Mr. Mead is not so sure. He nudges the body closer to the shore, then stops and yells, Hello, ma'am. Hello, miss. Hello? I expect you'll have to yell louder than that, Mr. Lucas suggests. Mr. Mead nods. Yep. Dead, sure as I'm standing here. Dead as dirt. But now he thinks Mr. Lucas should go fetch the coroner. Let him decide what to do. So off goes Mr. Lucas again, and now it's a long wait. Mr. Mead stands guard with his hook like a spear hunter over his kill, thinking of all the time this is going to take, when he would be nearly finished with his morning walk and inspection by now and heading back to the warmth of his house. The girl's legs swing out, the gray woolen skirt going with them, and Mead reins her back to the edge. A lock of hair has come loose from her combs and curls lazily across her forehead, her eyes looking glassily heavenward. Her prim little jacket looks so dignified against the dishevelment of her condition, as if she were only momentarily delayed here on the way to some important engagement. And then Lucas returns with Dr. Taylor. He's wearing his black coat and carrying his medical bag, balding and wall-eyed. He appears to survey both men at once. The three of them maneuver the body to the little gate in the picket fence, which Mr. Mead opens. Mr. Lucas goes out into the narrow grassy ledge and because the water level has dropped during the night, what with people drawing from the pipes, has to lie on his belly, Mr. Mead holding his legs and take hold of whatever he can, which happens to be the woman's right arm. It's up and stiff. He takes it at the wrist. It's like cold gutta percha and the hand is clutching mud. He tugs and she comes right up dripping water. Smaller than he thought, like a child, but round faced and strangely stout. Could be one of your German women from over in Manchester. He nods 
toward the industrial section across the river. Dr. Taylor pays no attention. He's feeling for a pulse, examining her eyes, pushing at her skin, unbuttoning her coat. Mr. Lucas can't take his eyes away from her. She looks like a perfect little doll. And now he wishes he had found her and could take her home with him. What an odd thought to have, he tells himself. Why would she come all the way over here to do herself in, he says, when the river's right there? Mr. Mead, Dr. Taylor says, would you mind lifting her head just so? But Mr. Mead cannot seem to take his, cannot seem to make himself touch the girl. And so Mr. Lucas obliges. It's not every day, he tells himself, that a dead girl washes up in your very own reservoir. And now as sure as anything, they'll be wanting him to drain it out. But as for himself, he doesn't see how a girl like this could unpurify the water. He wouldn't mind drinking it himself. Not at all. He is on the verge of telling this to Dr. Taylor when Dr. Taylor slaps her between the shoulder blades and water trickles from the corner of her mouth. Mr. Lucas keeps her head off the ground as if she were a sick child, and he is reluctant to let go when Dr. Taylor turns her onto her back again. Well, I'll stop there. The scene goes on, and uh, the inspector arrives. And then... The next scene, which I won't read, ends that chapter, and it also takes place at the reservoir, but it's several hours earlier, and it's in the point of view of a certain young man whom you'll get to know very well during the course of this story. So I'll stop here and ask if there's any questions that you all have about the writing of the book, the research, the writing life, um, just about anything else. Anybody? Some people have asked um, how long it took me to write this. Oh, did, I'm just, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to ask you a quick question. Sure. Um, I haven't read the book, but who killed her? <laughs> <laughs> Many people have asked that question, and since it is a mystery, um, I won't say, but, but there is a trial, and there is a verdict rendered. <laughs> and what I have is some explanatory notes in the back of the book. So if you do get interested in comparing what really happened with what happened in the book, you can do that and do some research. And I, um, I do take some liberties with the actual case. So uh, it's fiction. And, but I, you know, I tried to stick as much with it as I could. Uh, it was just uh, a very compelling case, and, and the court, I mean, the trial itself, is very much uh, as it happened, before and after, a little different. You know. How did I come across? Yeah, yeah. How did I come across the incident in the first place? Um, well, like I said, I was doing some rich, uh, research in Richmond. I was reading uh, Virginia's Dabney's history of. Richmond. I got to this period, <clears throat> 1880s, and just a brief mention, a short paragraph about this event, because it was so important at the time to these people. Well, I just got really interested, and I just thought, huh, that just sort of resonates with me in a way, just touched a chord. So I started looking into it, and um, I didn't know if I was going to find anything or not, really, but then there, there was all this information and I just, that was sort of the chills on the back of the neck. I, I realized this story had, was the one that I was going to work with and really sort of take it all away. State courthouse, uh, the question is did I go to the state courthouse to get records? Um, no, the, actually the, the court, the, um, uh, the, I did talk to some people in the courthouse they had moved all these records over to the Library of Virginia and to the um, archives. There's an archives holding center out at, near the airport in Richmond. Um, and you had to schedule uh, a, an appointment to go there. It was only on Thursdays. So I was <laughs> constantly going back on Thursday, back and forth from Richmond to Charlottesville, looking. And then you had six hours to do your research. They had took a one hour lunch break. And you'd just read until your eyes were just completely gone and do some copying and then that was it. So did, yeah, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, even though it was a fictional work, did you have to get permission or at least go through the formality of alerting people that you were working on this story? No. Um, 
I didn't. This, since it took place so long ago, uh, about 125 years ago, uh, it was just too far in the past. So I, I didn't. I didn't. I hope I don't have to worry about. It. No, so far, actually, some relatives have come forward since then. I've um, been in touch with a few of them, and they were actually delighted because they had this uh, skeleton in their closet and um, so this black sheep. That they're kind of proud of in a way. <laughs> Um, and so they were, they were happy to see that it had been turned into a novel. So, so far we're on safe ground. I, I, I think there's a statute of limitations, I hope, anyway. Yes. Hi. Hey, Hi. Julie. Um, I wanted to ask a question about your, trans your transition from writing you know, as a geographic and yeah. what your greatest challenge was when you turned to write fiction. I mean, was it tone or was it, I don't know, setting or plot or just... Yeah. Yeah, very good question. Um, so, how did I transition from writing uh, from national for National Geographic type things to writing fiction? Uh, and sure, it was everything tone and narrative structure, and these are all things that I've been playing with for years, uh, working on. Um, I, I will say that writing for National Geographic really helped me uh, to write about place. So that, like I said, that was very important to me, and so coming into a place and describing it, um, I had learned how to do that. And I'd also uh, learned a lot about research and, and learned when to stop. That becomes an important thing in a book like this. A lot of people just get buried in the research, whether it's nonfiction or, or fiction. And when you're writing on assignment, you have to stop at a certain point. So I would tell myself, okay, this and no more. And especially when I turned into fiction, I. I put. I actually had files, of, you know, a file case about this big. I took it out of my office and put it down in the basement because I didn't want to look at it anymore. It was just getting too much in my imagination. Um, but yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it was a process in just uh, learning how to write fiction. Um, a process many years in the making. Too many years, really. <laughs> I think the average is like ten years. It took me. Uh, I won't say how many, but a, a lot more than 10 years. <laughs> Good question, thanks, okay. What made you uh, decide to make this a work of fiction, particularly given your background in writing nonfiction? Yeah, so uh, what made me decide to make this a work of fiction instead of nonfiction? And it was just um, the nature of the story. I just was not able to get a handle on it, to make it a universal kind of story uh, as nonfiction. Uh, to me, the, the characters were interesting, but I, I, just, I didn't know who they were. And there are certain rules in nonfiction where if you start getting inside somebody's head too far and making up dialogue, then the reader's going to say, well, this, well th this didn't happen. What, what are you talking about? You're just speculating on this. And I think if you're clear about the rules from the beginning, like in um, uh, Killer Angels is a book about Gettysburg. It's a novel, and but, but since it's a novel, it's okay. He can just dive right into Robert E. Lee's head, do dialogue from Longstreet and all these people, and it's okay. Um, but so I, I I had to make that decision uh, that I just wasn't getting enough out of the the facts themselves. So that's why I, I did it as fiction, and I really wanted to explore the characters. That's to me what was the most interesting: the people and why they did what they did you know, and how they ended up where they ended up. Uh, so uh, that's the reason. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, in a minute. Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, can you talk about the writer's relationship to the <laughs> cadaver or the dead body? Because I'm struck that in the same way that the two men standing around the river are sort of mm -hmm. poking and prying, that it's the role of the writer to do that as well peel back the first layer of skin and mm. you know, dig a little deeper. I'm wondering um, how you feel about that as being an actual historical event and an actual body um, and how your uh, medical background informs that. <laughs> maybe how your you know, ethics of dissection have maybe changed uh -huh. with respect to writing this book or maybe not? Um, well, uh, that's a good complicated question. Um, so my medical background really was limited to about a day in medical school, so. Uh, but I did study biology uh, pretty, I was a biology minor. 
So um, I guess it informs the, that whole series of scenes to some degree. Um, I was really relying a lot on the information that I found about this particular case uh, as to uh, what happened with the autopsy and so on. Um, and there, there is an autopsy scene, by the way. Uh, it comes later on. But, um, you know, I, and I'm not sure about the rest of the question, but, uh, um, yeah, but I don't, in terms of my ethics about it, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it, it was a very dramatic thing, and I wanted to deliver that in as uh, emotional and immediate a way as I could to readers because it was a real thing. I mean, this kind of thing does happen. And if you feel it and see it and taste it, um, then you're just going to put your reader there in, in a visceral way. And I think that's very important in a work like this. Um, when you're, to not stand back from it, to just stare it right in the face as, as uh, hard as you can and deliver it in as real a way as you can. But, but with uh, dignity, you know, you, it's, you, I wasn't going for shock value. Uh, um, one of the things when I was doing research, I came across Lily's grave. It was just a very um, emotional discovery. I, it took some trouble to find it. And when I did find it, it was a very small, flat stone. I felt this real connection to these people. And I wanted to render a story that would do them justice. Hi. At the beginning of your talk, you spoke at length about the importance of place. Place names. I know that for many writers that's very important. Is there any way in which Richmond specifically bled into or embellished you know, the, the fabric of, of what you discussed? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Richmond was just sort of always the backdrop. It was like another character in the book. Um, and, and a lot of people have really liked the way that was handled. Uh, so yeah, the description of the time and the place, um, the, <clears throat> the, the lawyers, most of them had, were uh, Confederate veterans, uh, and they drew on this background to try to sway the jury. Uh, and you saw um, people, one-legged veterans swinging down the streets. Um, uh, Richmond after the war, too, was, was a really interesting place. It had grown hugely, and there were all these uh, brothels and saloons and things to, to service the the, the military that had been there during the, the, the Reconstruction era. Um, and, and so it suddenly changed. It was sort of like a culture shock. It had, uh, Richmond had just been thrust from uh, the uh, uh, pre-modern era into this post-war type um, city. And I really wanted to capture that, that, that shift that had happened and how that was exciting and kind of scary. Yeah, go ahead. Um, could, yes, lots of poets. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't hear the question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the question is rhyming critical American poetry. Well, I, I'm not a poet, so I, I can't say. I, I'm not an expert on that. I, I think, from what I know, no, it's not that important <laughs> to, to, to modern, although there's some formalists still out there. Um, and I'm yes. wondering why you decided to do that and what difference do you think it made in your career <laughs> and in your life? Okay. Yeah, sure. That's a good, that's a, we could talk about that for an hour. I, um, why I went back to school to get a degree in writing and what difference it made. And I've thought about this a lot over the years. Um, I think mostly what it was is just a commitment to myself and to my family just to say, this is what I'm doing, this is what I care about. Um, uh, that I have decided I want to take this seriously and be a writer. And then, uh, so I spent the two and a half years getting the degree, the creative writing degree. Um, I don't think it's necessary at all to 
get that degree to be a writer uh, of any sort. It's necessary, though, if you want to be a teacher and support yourself as a writer by teaching. You need that degree. You need an MFA, at least. So and I, that, I was thinking of, of that at the time as well, that I might want to do that. So that's really, the, in a nutshell, why I did it. And uh, we're getting some signals that, is that, are we? No, OK, yeah. Anyway, it was a great time of my life. It, um, just spending this time with people, with other people. We were in this little community of writers, people who were very serious about it and committed to it, and that was very helpful as well. You know, that's a rarefied thing, and a lot of people, if, even if they're not in in these writing programs, build their own communities of writers, either online or they just find them, you know, or in different places, and they meet every so often. I haven't been in a writing workshop for a long time now, but it was very helpful at the time, uh, just to get some real serious critique uh, and uh, and to take the what we were doing seriously. Okay, well, this has been a real pleasure. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.